Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Starbucks' stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Starbucks is a multinational chain of coffee houses. It is the world's largest coffee house chain. The company is headquartered in Seattle, Washington and was founded in 1971, 50 years ago. It started trading in 1992 and can be found on the NASDAQ, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, Vienna, Swiss, Santiago, Kazakhstan, Sao Paulo, Italian Bourse, Lima, and Buenos Aires stock exchanges. It has 32,660 stores in 83 countries, including 16,600 company operated stores and 16,000 licensed stores. Of the 32,660 stores, 18,354 of them are in the US, Canada, or Latin America. It serves hot and cold drinks, whole bean coffee, espresso, cafe latte, full and loose leaf teas, fresh juices, frappuccinos, pastries, chips, sandwiches, and much more. They also sell seasonal items such as pumpkin spice latte during Christmas time. Some stores sell items specific for that location. Almost all stores offer free Wi-Fi. It started in 1971, but after the business was sold to Howard Schultz in the 80s, it grew massively to the giant it is today. He was CEO from 86 to 2000 and 2008 to 2017. The company has received significant criticism about its business practices, corporate affairs, and role in society. Conversely, it has achieved substantial brand loyalty, market share, and company value. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 139 billion market cap. They're trading at 117 a share, and they have 1.2 billion shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video and free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see their free cash flow is all over the place from 10 billion to 100 million. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And that was 4.5 billion in 2018, dropping to 1 billion in the trailing 12 months. Revenue is a sales for the company that peaked in 2019 at 26.5 billion. It dropped a bit in 2020. It came up a little in a trailing 12 months. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales, and their sales dropped in 2020 due to COVID, less people going out and buying coffee. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the expenses directly related to generating the revenue. Example is the cost of beans and the cost of labor. Revenue minus cost of revenue gives you your gross profit and that dropped from 7.5 billion to 5.4 billion. Below that is operating expenses. A big operating expense for them is marketing. And below that is operating income. And that dropped from 4 billion to 1.8 billion. They paid about half a billion dollars of interest on their debt. That's the most interest they paid in a 12 month period. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income. Their net income has come down a lot since 2019. It's 1 billion. In 2019, it was 3.6 billion. But a big reason their net income is so high in 2018 and 19 is this other income and expense. And these dollar amounts are mainly for mergers, acquisitions, and the sale of some businesses. I would focus on operating income when I look at the income statement, not net income. But overall, their numbers still look pretty good. They are down from 2019, but that's a given because in 2020, less people were going out and they don't really do delivery. So their business, of course, was down during COVID. But I'm pretty sure they're gonna have the highest revenue in 2021. This is the company's statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. So they had a ton of operating cash flow in 2018, $12 billion. It more than doubled from 2020 to the trailing 12 months. The reason their operating cash flow was so high in 2018 is because they received $7 billion from Nestle. Nestle now has the ability to sell Starbucks products for the next 40 years. So the $7 billion was for 40 years of royalties. The $7 billion will sit on the balance sheet and every year, 1 40th of it will go onto the income statement. So if it wasn't for that $7 billion, they would have about $5 billion of operating cash flow in 2018. Also, some people may say the reason operating cash flow was low in 2020 is due to COVID, but it's not low in the trailing 12 months and they had similar net income in 2020 and the trailing 12 months. Let me show you why. In 2020, they had negative $1.4 billion in changes in payables. And if you look at 2019, they had a positive $1.3 billion in changes in payables. So to give you a really simple example, even though this is not the actual payables, 
Let's just say they bought $1.3 billion of coffee beans from a vendor. Starbucks told the vendor, I'm going to pay you for these coffee beans in about six months or so. And the vendor said, okay, you do whatever you want to do. You're my best customer. So when you buy something on credit, it's the same as getting a loan. If you go to the bank and get a loan, you actually got cash. So obviously your cash goes up. But in this case, you didn't get cash. You got coffee beans, but you didn't have to spend the cash. So in a sense, your cash should still go up. So it went up 1.3 billion because they didn't have to spend any money. And then in 2020, they paid the cash to the vendor. So their cash went down. When you look at the statement of cash flows, it's actual cash that comes in and out. But when you look at the income statement, they use accrual accounting. So the income statement spreads the costs out. You see the $7 billion we talked about earlier from that royalty payment? That won't go onto the income statement. That's spread out over 40 years. Because in 2018, even though they received $7 billion of cash, as you can see here, if they put that onto their income statement, then in 2018, investors will look at the income statement and said, Starbucks is rich. Look how much money they're making. This is the best company in the world. They're so profitable. But it's kind of deceiving because that $7 billion is for 40 years of royalties. I have a business and when a company pays me, I use cash accounting. Whatever a company pays me, I report on my income. But for big companies, pretty much all the companies that trade public, they have to use accrual accounting. They spend about $1.4 billion to $2 billion in CapEx. CapEx are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. So they had a ton of free cash flow in 2018, $10 billion. But if you strip out the $7 billion, it should have been around $3 billion, which is how much it was in 2019, $3 billion. And the reason it's lower in 2020, it is due to lower sales, but it's also due to that $1 billion they paid in accounts payable. So if it wasn't for that large accounts payable payment, their free cash flow in 2020 would have been over $1 billion. They use a lot of debt to fund their business. They issued $5.5 billion in 2018, $2 billion in 2019. They did repay $350 million, so they added $1.65 billion. They added about $5 billion in 2020 and about $600 million in the trailing 12 months. Since the interest payments are so low on debt, lots of companies use debt to fund their business and acquire other companies. They also buy back a ton of capital stock. They bought back $7 billion in 2018, $10 billion in 2019, and $1.7 billion in 2020. When a company buys back capital stock, it decreases the shares outstanding, making your shares more valuable. This top chart shows their shares outstanding since 2006. So you can see it was close to $1.6 billion. Now it's down to $1.2 billion. And the red bars are the stocks they bought back. The green bars are the stocks they issued. So they buy back a lot of stock. They reward their shareholders by buying back stock. Some people say this is deceiving. They're artificially inflating stock price. But when a company first starts out for the first 10 or 15 years, they keep issuing stock and diluting the shareholders. So investors complain, my stock is getting diluted. But when a company becomes profitable, they have lots of cash, so they buy back stock. Investors still complain because they're buying back stock and inflating the stock price. Whether a company buys back stock or issues new stock, I have to trust they're doing it to improve the company's value in the future. So they decreased the shares outstanding from 1.6 billion to 1.2 billion. That's about 400 million. This is the company's equity section of the balance sheet. They received about $600 million from the issuance of capital stock, and they have negative $8 billion of retained earnings. Some people look at this and say the company is worth nothing. It may go bankrupt any day. It's worth negative $8 billion. The reason they have negative retained earnings is because they kept buying back stock. When you buy back stock, that decreases your cash because you have to use cash to buy back the stock. And it also reduces the value of your equity section on your balance sheet. Remember just before I said Starbucks bought back about 400 million shares of their stock? Well, they can issue that stock if they want to. And if they do issue that stock, that will increase their cash balance and also improve the equity balance on their balance sheet. Say they reissued all 400 million shares of stock at 117 per share. That's what the stock price is trading at. That would give them $47 billion. They're sitting on $47 billion of stock. I would not worry about this negative retained earnings of $8 billion. They know what they're doing. And they bought the stock when it was trading much lower, when it was trading at $50, $60, $70 a share, because it's trading at its all-time high right now. So they had to buy it when it was trading lower. So it's like when you buy stock, you want to buy when it's low and sell when it's high. They already bought the stock when it was low, and they could sell it anytime they want at the higher price. Let's look at their capital structure. They have negative 7.7 .7 billion of equity, 24 billion of debt. 
When we talk about the price to book value ratio later, I'm gonna show you why this negative is meaningless. They have 19.5 billion of net debt and their WAC is 8%. That's the weighted average cost of capital. That's how much it costs this company to obtain debt and equity financing. And that's the discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 132 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $113 billion. We divide that by 1.2 billion shares. And we get a calculated stock price of $96. They're trading at 117, so they're trading at a 23% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Just because I think a stock is overvalued doesn't mean I won't buy the stock. When I did my video of Costco, I said their stock is overvalued and I still bought Costco stock because I know in the long run, these companies will continue growing. The intrinsic value is only one tool. There's so many other things to consider when buying a stock. Simply Wall Street is also saying the stock is overvalued. They're saying it's worth $81 a share. 21 analysts priced this stock and the average price target was 126. The low was 104, the high was 140. Pricing a stock is a lot different than estimating their future free cash flows. I'm not saying pricing is bad, it's just a different approach. When you buy a home, you use pricing. If you were to buy a home, you wouldn't estimate the cash flows that home would generate. Maybe if you were renting out the home, but if you were buying a home for yourself, you wouldn't do that. What you would do, or your realtor would do, they would just look at a home in the neighborhood and see what the price is. And then price your home similar to another home in the neighborhood with a similar amount of square feet and stuff. So that's what pricing is. So for real estate, pricing is far superior. But for investments like stocks, trying to figure out the cash that asset generates is a better approach. This is where the stock has been trading the past 29 years. So it looks like it was pretty flat for a while, but it's hard to tell on a chart that has almost three decades of information. But the past decade, a lot of stocks have shot up a lot like this. In the past year, the stock has done really well, up about 50, 60%. It was pretty flat for a few months now, but from July to February, it kept rising. They raise their dividend every year from 20 cents up to 45 cents. They pay a 1.5% dividend yield, and they pay out 200% of their net income and 86% of their free cash flow. I like to look at dividend over free cash flow because net income can be a little skewed due to accounting, but they're still paying out most of their cash and dividends. But I expect their free cash flow to grow a lot to 4 or 5 billion by the end of this year and next year. Their industry pays a 1.9% dividend, and analysts are forecasting their dividend to grow to 1.8%. And they have a pretty low beta, 0.88, so the stock moves less than the market. The stock has outperformed the S&P up 62%, S&P is up 38%. The 52-week low was 72, the high was 119. And the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. And this is a pretty popular stock, about 5 million shares are traded each day. All the shares outstanding are on float, 71% are held by institutions, and 1% of the shares are shorted. In the past year, this stock has outperformed its industry and the market. In the past three years, this stock has crushed its industry and crushed the market. In the past five years, it has outperformed its industry, but it's traded pretty close to the market, both up about 125%. Analysts aren't too bullish on this stock, projecting their earnings to grow 17%, its industry to grow a whopping 44%. Same thing with the revenue, this company to grow 9%, its industry 21%. In the past five years, their annual earnings have struggled down 10%. In the past year, down 71%. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you'd be really happy. You'd be up almost 600%. Your 10,000 will be worth about $70,000 today. That's a 21% annual return. The biggest shareholder is Vanguard at 8%, then BlackRock, State Street, Magellan, and Geode. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average P.E. in the market is 33, the median is 22. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share, they're at 139. This would indicate the stock is really overvalued if you're a big proponent of the P.E. ratio. But the way you calculate earnings per share, it's net income over shares outstanding. Their net income was pretty low, about $1 billion. So that's why they have a bad P.E. But let's say it was $3 billion, close to 2019. Still their P.E. would be about 45, not such a good ratio. Price to sales is decent at 5.8. That's between the market median and average. And we can't look at their price to book because they have negative equity. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is on the balance sheet. It's assets minus liabilities. And they have negative 7.7 .7 billion of equity. I was watching some other YouTube videos on this company and they were saying this is really bad that they have negative equity. 
but you should really look at the balance sheet to understand what the assets are and what the liabilities are. Unearned revenue accounts for $8 billion of their liabilities. Unearned revenue is revenue they received but haven't delivered the product yet. $7 billion of that is from the Nestle royalty. $1 billion is from customers buying gift cards that haven't used the cards yet. So even though it's a liability, they don't owe anything. If you pull out that $8 billion of unearned revenue in the liability section, they actually have positive equity. To explain how it works, say I went into Starbucks, bought $50 of coffee and baked goods. I gave the cashier $50. They gave me the coffee. They gave me the products. What Starbucks would do is they would put that $50 onto their balance sheet in the asset section cash. That cash would go up $50. In order for the balance sheet to balance, we have to apply a double entry accounting. So we have to put that $50 somewhere else. It actually goes onto the income statement as revenue because Starbucks delivered the product to me. So they have to report it as revenue. And that revenue flows onto the income statement down to the bottom to net income. So at the end of the year, the company has to wipe out their income statement. They take all their net income, say it was $2 billion. They would take that 2 billion and put it into retained earnings on the balance sheet in the equity section. Now the balance sheet balances. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. So that $50 I gave to Starbucks improved their cash and improved their equity. Say I went into Starbucks, gave them $50 of cash for a gift card. Starbucks would add $50 of cash to the asset section of the balance sheet. Their cash goes up $50. But they can't put $50 of revenue onto the income statement because I did not buy any products yet. I just bought a gift card. So they put $50 in the liability section as unearned revenue. Now say in three months, I go to Starbucks with my $50 gift card and I buy $50 of products. What Starbucks would do is they would take the $50 out of unearned revenue and put it onto the income statement as revenue. That revenue would flow down to the bottom of the income statement to net income. At the end of the year, they would wipe out their net income and put it into retained earnings, the double entry. In that transaction, their liabilities went down $50 and their equity went up $50. Don't just assume negative equity is bad. 30, 40 years ago, it probably was bad, but companies are much bigger. They're getting more creative. They can cover their interest payments almost four times with their operating income. This is what you need to look at when you see negative equity. As long as they can cover the interest payments on their debt, they're fine. Whether a company has positive or negative equity is irrelevant. They just need to cover the interest payments on their debt. And this company can do it almost four times. We can't look at the ROE because they have negative equity. They can cover their current liabilities with their current assets. They have $4 billion in cash, $1.2 billion in receivables, and $1.5 billion of inventory. So they generated about $2.5 billion of free cash flow in the trailing 12 months. They have half a billion of working capital, and they paid out $2.1 billion of dividend payments in the past 12 months. So they have $820 million of funding. But these big companies don't need a ton of cash on their balance sheet. If they wanted to, they can go to any bank or any investor and get cash right away, or they can sell stock. They don't need to keep cash tied up. They want to use cash to grow the business. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 15 companies in the same industry as Starbucks. And if Starbucks has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in blue, they're better than the average. They're pretty much worse in every ratio. Excluding McDonald's, they're the biggest company on this list. And they do pay a higher dividend than average at 1.5%. So to summarize, I have them trading at a 23% premium, but I think this is a great stock for a long-term hold. You wanna invest in a big company that's probably gonna be around a really long time, that has a great brand name, that brings in lots of revenue and lots of free cash flow. You may not get a 5X or 10X return on this stock, but what stocks can you get that return on consistently? You might get it on one, but then 10 other stocks you invest in, you lose your money. So overall, you might not have made any money. And this company is constantly growing. They're always adding new stores. And each year they close down the bottom 1% of underperforming stores because they wanna give you the greatest return on your investment. So the stores that aren't making money, they shut down and they're still increasing stores overall because they're adding so many stores. And there's a lot of other countries they can get into. I rank their free cash flow 6 out of 10, their revenue 7 out of 10, and their ratios 2 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.